Welcome to week two. The next few weeks we will be working on beams. We will be testing and designing various beam like structures as well as modeling and predicting their failure modes. So this lecture hopefully will between this and the reading material posted on Angel will help get us through the next few weeks. This is a picture of a high-rise building being constructed. There's multiple different beams here. There's at least three different kinds. You have the large girder beams that are being supported by the post. These large girder beams serve as a support for our floor joists that go back into the page. These floor joists appear to be uh, appear to be truss-like structures that are simply supported there so they're supported at two sides they're supported at this girder as well as at the other girder and then there's a third type that you could maybe stretch and say is, is present here uh, the flooring material that spans between each individual simply supported truss could also be considered a beam if you look at it from a cross-sectional area standpoint or if you take a cross-section of it in the top left here we have a pulley. This pulley here is a cantilevered beam. Uh, it's cantilevered because it's supported. It has two supports yet it's cantilevered over the edge here. In the top right hand corner is another example of a cantilevered beam. So the top of the beam here that supports these light fixtures uh, is a cantilevered beam supported by this post, post B. The bottom left hand corner we're looking at a cross section of a roadway or of a super highway similar to the first image that we looked at of the high rise structure we have multiple different beam types here there is the large beam that spans between the posts A and B these are likely spaced you know every couple hundred feet as well then is the I beams that are then on top and these are simple these I beams are simply supported as is this large beam actually so the I beams are simply supported as they go back into the page and go from one of these structures to the other structure and then this top thin item here that's the roadway uh, like I was mentioning before the flooring system so this roadway could also be modeled as a beam again since we're looking at it from a cross-section standpoint then here in the bottom right hand corner we have two different uh, beam types here we have a simply supported beam down here at the bottom simply supported by two different supports i.e. the wheels and then on the top here we have a cantilevered beam that's supported by this uh, strut as well as by the corner here that's supporting our, our engine. So a cantilever beam is, is up here and are simply supported down below. Here are some less common beams or items that could be modeled as beams. A wing can actually be modeled as a beam. And this would be considered a cantilever beam, right? It's uh, supported by the by the tires or the wheels and then it's cantilevered out over the edge we then have our supported beam where the skier is, his ski is, is supported by a relatively uniform distribu distributed load of the snow and then we have a hinge and pin system so this pin is uh, like in your doorway for your room so there's uh, this can also be modeled as a simply supported beam if you were to pull the pin out and, and were to look at where the forces are applied. So these forces here are your supports and then this here is your load. So again, another simply supported beam. And then this truck, again, is a simply supported beam uh, supported by the wheels in the front and the back and it's simply supported over the top. Looks like there's a cantilevered beam that it's that it's carrying uh, so it's supported has two supports but then it's cantilevered over the edge here on the top so a simply supported truck is carrying a cantilevered beam so here we have a picture of a 
piece of material or a, we'll call it a sample beam this beam here we drew drew a square on here and and I want you to notice how the beam is then when the beam is bent how the square changes so if you look you'll notice that the top square became elongated while the bottom square became compressed so if you try and think through bending this piece of material it might be considered common sense that that this bottom here is is being compressed while the top is being stretched you can kind of see that in the lines this line is longer than it was before where this line is now shorter than it was before so we have compression occurring at the bottom of our beam and we have tension uh, occurring at the top of our beam. So now we need to try and put that to use. So in order to put that to use we have various pressures and, and forces that are being applied to this beam and we now need to on the next slide we'll, we'll examine those in further detail. Uh, before we get to that we'll do a quick little example just using the information that we just talked about. So if somebody normally steps on your foot it doesn't necessarily hurt all that bad if you have a 226 pound person and they they have a, a their foot maybe it's 14 square inches when they step on your foot it doesn't hurt all that bad but if you play sports or anything and someone steps on you with cleats you recognize it hurts a lot more well imagine if you were to be stepped on with stilts that would hurt quite a bit so the calculation that we can use to figure out what the pressure, the actual pressure that they would be exerting upon you is force over area. So our force is 226 pounds and if each stilt tip is one square inch we have two stilt tips so we have 226 pounds divided by two square inches which means that the pressure being exerted by the man on the stilts is 113 pounds per square inch. So again, like I said, if that was if they stood on your foot, that would probably hurt. Uh, the challenge, however, though, when we're dealing with cantilevered beams, is that we don't get to use that same formula. And the reason why is because this force is being uh, applied perpendicular to our cantilevered beam. So let's look at how we can how we can approach that topic. When we're talking about pressure and material properties, typically we, we refer to it as stress. So stress, like pressure, can be positive or negative. This particular cross-section uh, shows that beam that we were looking at a few slides ago, and it shows that at the top, the pressure is being directed apart, where at the bottom, the pressure is being directed together. So the maximum pressure or stress uh, the two terms are nearly interchangeable so at the top of our of our beam we have the maximum tensile strength and at the bottom of our beam we have the maximum compression strength you can see that as we get to the neutral axis we actually have no stress in the neutral axis and if you remember back to a few slides ago when we had the the different squares that center that center line uh, was the same length on both of the beams on both pictures of the beams so where does common sense tell you that this beam is going to break at the top why do you think that it breaks at the top our beams going to break at the top because the materials act differently in tension versus compression so this particular type of material being wood does not act well or does not uh, cannot hold a lot of ten tensile stress however it does very well in compression Stress within a beam is a function of three different characteristics. Those characteristics are moment, neutral axis of the beam, and the area moment of inertia. 
So if we look at stress, this is the formula for stress, MC over I. It would be my opinion that this is a formula that's just worth memorizing. It's something that you will use in all engineering disciplines, uh, not just civil engineering disciplines. So each of these functions of the configuration for this particular situation um, can be described as follows. So the moment is a function of the force and the distance from the support of the beam. So the way that we calculate moment is force times distance. So we have a force out here at distance L. So in order to calculate the value for M, we take the amount of force and we multiply that by the length of our beam and that will give us our moment. The neutral axis, which is our C term, is a function of the cross-sectional area of the beam at the point where we're modeling the beam. So if we have a rectangular cross-section, then our C value is going to be our height divided by 2. We're looking for the center line of our particular beam. So if our beam is cattywampus and, and an odd shape, then you have to perform some calculations to figure out where the, the, center, the center line, if you will, is of that particular beam. And then the area moment of inertia uh, that is a so like I started to say the area moment of inertia is a little bit more complicated it's a function of the shape of the cross-sectional area and the neutral axis so you can mathematically figure out this value uh, this is the reason why all of you are in calculus currently um, however, we have a nifty little shortcut for rectangular shaped beams. So the rectangular shaped beam, we have base times height cubed divided by 12. That will give us our moment er of inertia. So as our beam changes, if it gets taller or if it gets wider, it's going to change our moment of inertia uh, because these two values here will change. So, one too far. So this is a few different calculations that we've, or formulas we've shown. So stress, remember, MC over I, this is important to memorize. You'll want to memorize that. Then in order to figure out uh, the moment, remember moment is force times length. Our neutral axis or C is equal to the height divided by 2 for any sort of rectangular uh, beam and then our moment of inertia can be calculated again for rectangular beams is B times H cubed divided by 12 if we plug in these three different formulas for our, our main formula that we memorized of MC over I uh, we end up solving and, and moving through and we end up getting this as our formula for stress for a rectangular cross-sectional beam. The maximum stress in a given beam is called the modulus of rupture. So this is occurring right there at the top of the beam right before the beam breaks. That would be the maximum stress point. More values uh, have been experimentally measured and tabulated for various types of materials so for our experiment we're going to be using yellow poplar as part of your report it will be important to go find typical values of yellow poplar uh, those can be found online you can go to the library there's various sources out there uh, to be able to find that out uh, this modulus of rupture can be calculated using this formula again very similar to what we just were looking at on the previous page